This week on Scripturology. Jesus said the distinguishing mark of his followers would be their love for one another. So the witness of the church depends on its members genuinely loving one another. I don't think that Jesus forgot that much of the time we are all an unlovable lot. Have you heard the expression, friends in high places? It's usually used in the context of receiving some kind of benefit because you know someone who is well-connected. At one point in my husband's working career, he was managing a manufacturing facility in Delaware. The governor of the state was looking to develop manufacturing and gave my husband the use of his private box to see a Formula One race at Dover Downs. The governor's box was catered, and Gary and I ate some of the biggest, tastiest shrimp we had ever had that day. Now, we don't remember who won the race, but we still talk about the governor's shrimp. On today's scripturology lesson, we'll be reminded that having friends in high places doesn't always mean there will be a benefit. There can be a cost to pay. We're going to begin our lesson by reading John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask in my Father's name, he may ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another." Uh, verse 1 of chapter 15 gives us the seventh and final of the I am statements of Jesus recorded in the Gospel of John. We've seen Jesus say, I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the door of the sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, and last week, the way, the truth, and the life. Now Jesus says he's the true vine. And this time he adds something about the Father. He says the father is the vine dresser. Okay, so that's picture of the gardener or farmer. And Jesus builds a metaphor around this agricultural picture. He says his followers are branches of the vine, which is himself. And there are three kinds of branches. Those who don't bear fruit, those who bear some fruit, and those who bear much fruit. One thing that is very clear is that the vine dresser expects every branch to be a fruit-bearing branch. Now, there are 
two big questions that arise from this text. The first question is, what's meant by fruit? Now, some people teach that fruit are other believers. They say, if you're not winning souls to Christ, you're not bearing fruit. And there are others who say that fruit are the good works that Christians are to do. Their rationale is that fruit is produce, so Christians must be productive, and that means producing benefit for the kingdom. Now, both of these things are true. Branches ought to be engaged in evangelism. But scripture never says that we're responsible for the results. We have no power to draw souls to Christ. Jesus said twice in John chapter 6 that no one can come to him unless the Father draws him. It's also true that Christians should do good works so that those who see those works will give glory to God. But I think the fruit that Jesus is talking about here is the fruit that Paul identifies in Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Why do I think Jesus is talking about the fruit of the Spirit? Because the context here isn't about evangelism. Jesus is talking about discipleship. Unsaved people do good, charitable works. But Jesus would be concerned about good works that flow from a godly character molded by the Holy Spirit. Good works done apart from the indwelling of the Spirit, they don't make people fruitful branches. If that were the case, then rich men could buy their way into heaven, right? And that's why I think this has got to be talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Now, this is just a random thought, but whenever the subject of spiritual fruit comes up, I always think about the t-shirt that I saw once that says, God wants spiritual fruit, not religious nuts. <laughs> Have you seen that one? The second question generated by this vine metaphor in our text is, if all the branches represent true believers, what are we to make of the fate of those unfruitful branches, those that are thrown into the fire and burned? Uh, scripturology viewers are learning that when we want to understand doctrine, we look at the breadth of scripture on a subject and not just one isolated verse. We saw back in John 10 that Jesus said, he gives his sheep eternal life, and they will never perish, nor will anyone snatch them out of his or his father's hand. When we get to John 17, uh, we're going to see that Jesus guards those who belong to him. Those passages and others are clear that if you belong to Christ, it is for keeps. So this passage in John 15 must not be talking about salvation or Jesus would be preaching opposing doctrines. What he can be talking about is the church body of which he is the head. You know, are there those in the church whose relationship to Christ is only superficial and external? Yep. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 13, 30, using the metaphor of weeds and wheat. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them into bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus said that the weeds among the wheat will meet the same fate as these unfruitful branches. They'll be burned. The weeds were part of the visible church, but they did not belong to the true invisible church. I want to focus for a bit now on a word that was repeated 10 times in the first 10 verses. The word was abide. And Jesus said abiding in him is necessary to produce fruit. In fact, in verse 5, Jesus says that the one who abides in him bears much fruit. That should have our attention because Christians want to bear much fruit. I mean, who wants to be mediocre? No. <laughs> so we should understand then what this abiding entails. In verse 7, we see that abiding in Jesus is connected to having his words abide in you. Uh, 
When his words abide in you, then you can ask for what you want and expect to receive it. But that doesn't happen before your asking is aligned with his words. So let me ask you, are the words of Jesus abiding in you? Have you memorized more than just John 3.16 and Matthew 7.1? When we have the word of God hidden in our heart, then when temptation comes, the Holy Spirit has something to bring back to our memory to help us resist that temptation. Because, you know, temptation doesn't usually present itself when you have your Bible in your lap. You need to have your Bible in your mind. And this brings us to the second connection to abiding. In verse 10, Jesus says that we are to abide in his love, and we do this when we keep his commandments. Having the word in our mind or heart, as the psalmist says, helps us to keep God's commandments and demonstrates that we are abiding in him. After telling his disciples that they are to keep his commandments, Jesus gives them a specific command to focus on in verse 12. They are to love one another. Do you ever wonder why Jesus focused on such a difficult command? Instead of loving others, our nature is to want to hover on verse 9 where Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. And actually, I am going to hover on that verse for just a minute because I hope it will bless you in the way that it did me several years ago. Maybe you've heard it said by Christians before that if you were the only person on earth, Jesus would have come to die for you. I'd heard that a lot, and every time I did, I thought, well, that's a nice sentiment. I just wish it was in the Bible. If it was in the Bible, then maybe I could believe it. Well, I remember like it was last week. I was sitting in the ladies' lounge at Emanuel Baptist Church in Lexington, Kentucky. You know, I was killing some time before choir practice started, and I was reading John 15. This actually was about a dozen years ago. When I read verse 9, my eyes just got big as potatoes, and I saw what it said, and I started to cry. When I read, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, I realized that the Father loves Jesus. How? As his only son. If Jesus loves me like the Father loves him, then that means that he loves me with the depth of an only child. When I saw that, then I could believe that if I was the only one on earth, Jesus would have died for me. I needed to know that because neither of my parents were fond of me, and they made sure I knew it. it they're both deceased now. Now, I know that Ephesians 1 says that those who are saved have been chosen from before the foundation of the world, and that contemplating that we might be the only one on earth is just a hypothetical exercise. But so many of us struggle or have struggled to believe the depths of God's love for us. It truly is a comfort and a deep joy to contemplate that Jesus loves us as the Father loves him. Okay, so now we can get back to the question, why did Jesus focus his disciples' attention on the command to love one another? It's a very simple command, and yet it's such a difficult command. In the first place, we need to remember Jesus' words are part of the continuing farewell discourse. Jesus is going to be arrested in a matter of hours from now, and he knows what's ahead for himself as well as for his disciples. They were going to need each other. And that is no less true for the body of Christ today. We do need each other. For many of us, the church family is what we have because of geographical or spiritual separation. But all of us need brothers and sisters in Christ to love us with encouragement or help or correction even. We are not meant to be lone rangers. But there's another reason Christ's followers must love one another. We saw it back in chapter 13. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus said the distinguishing mark of his followers would be their love for one another. So the witness of the church depends on its members genuinely loving one another. I don't think that Jesus forgot that much of the time we are all an unlovable lot. 
but our love for one another, even and especially when we are unlovable, reflects exactly how the Father loves. This is what Paul had to say about God's love. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we know that Jesus loves us the way the Father loves him, shouldn't we seek to glorify Jesus by loving each other the way that the Father loves us? We have no excuse to say, I'm not going to love this brother or that sister because they are an unlovable jerk. So, God sent Jesus to die for us when we were unlovable jerks. And no one has had completely the un lovable jerks sanctified out of them. If you want to do amazing things that bring glory to the name of Christ, you do not have to go to Timbuktu. You love that unlovable, irritating, difficult person in your church. There is no shortage. Every church has them. I might be my churches. We'll be right back after this brief break. I want you to know that I consider it a blessing and a privilege to be able to teach the Word of God, especially to the women who watch Christian Television Network. My prayer is that as we're deep into the Gospel of John, we're abiding in Christ's words, becoming fruitful and proving to be His disciples. While television is a very useful medium for communication, there's nothing sweeter than learning and fellowshipping together in person. If your church is planning a women's retreat or event in the future, I'd love to be considered for your speaker. I ask no set fee, but all honorariums go to support the Ministry of Scripturology. You can contact me through our website, scripturology.com. Before we move on to the next section, I want to talk about something we didn't get to in the last section. In verses 14 and 15, Jesus referred to the disciples as friends, saying they were no longer servants because he had shared with them what the Father had said. If these disciples believed, as Peter and Martha had confessed, that Jesus was the Son of God, then hearing him call them friends was a big deal because other than the patriarch of Israel himself, Abraham, no one had ever been called God's friend. But I want us to think about something. We know that our gospel writer John liked to refer to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. But can you think of any apostle who referred to themselves as Jesus' friend? No, they kept referring to themselves as the doulos, or slave, of Jesus. And they kept referring to him as Lord and Master. I'm afraid many Christians have clamped on to this verse where Jesus honored his disciples by calling them friends. And they've used it as a license to make Jesus their buddy in a way that demeans him, in a way in which the disciples never would have. Now, I brought a gross example of this to show. There's this T-shirt here that says, Jesus is my boyfriend and he spoils me rotten. Now notice, you see the he is in little letters and the me is capitalized. Something to notice. Well, I was shocked when I saw this and you know it was online and even online you know I felt kind of dirty buying it this stuff is sold by Christian businesses can I just go on the record and say Jesus is no one's boyfriend take a look at these words from theologian D.A. Carson neither God nor Jesus is ever referred to in scripture as the friend of anyone of course, this does not mean that either God or Jesus is an unfriend. If one measures friendship strictly on the basis of who loves most, guilty sinners can find no better and truer friend than in the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Son whom he has sent. But mutual, reciprocal friendship of the modern variety is not in view and cannot be without demeaning God. I find this t-shirt offensive and demeaning to God. 
we need to follow the example of the apostles and remember that Jesus is Lord and Master. And we need to retain their attitude of humble servants only doing what is expected of us. Okay, now that I've got that out of my system, I guess we can move on to reading John chapter 15, verses 18 through 25. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But in all these things, all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the, the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. I just have to get this off the table. <laughs> the love from the first half of our lesson is balanced with a lot of hate in the second half. Again, we have to keep the context of the time in which Jesus was speaking in view. His disciples would be hated by the world which crucified their Lord each of them, except John, would die a martyr's death according to tradition. So Jesus warns them about what's coming, and it was a loving thing to do. Can you imagine Jesus letting his disciples be blindsided with persecution? He didn't do that. Of course, we know that this hatred towards Christ's disciples continues to this day, worse in some places than in others. The hatred stems from two facts. First, Jesus' disciples no longer belong to this world. They've been chosen out of it and have been given a new nature, which has values and objectives that are in opposition to the world's values and objectives. The second reason the world will hate Jesus' disciples is because they hate him. We hear the world give a lot of lip service to Jesus being a wonderful moral teacher, but that is a stripped down version of his true identity. The world hates the Jesus who is God incarnate and who will one day judge their soul by his word. But Jesus said something interesting in this passage. In verse 22, he said that if he hadn't come and spoken to the people, they wouldn't be guilty of their sin. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean that the people wouldn't have sinned if Jesus hadn't come and that somehow his coming entrapped them? I do think that to some degree Jesus' presence incited the worst deliberate rejection of God. But I think that John is talking about the same thing Paul talked about in Romans in regard to the law. That Jesus and the law brought awareness of sin. After you're aware of your sin, you know, it can't be excused any longer. Man's problem is that Romans 2.15 says the law is written on the hearts of natural men. That's why Cain could be punished and the earth could be flooded before Moses ever wrote the law. The conscience of man that convicts him of his sin is another reason he will hate God. Because the unregenerate man loves his darkness and hates the light. So maybe you'd take this under advisement and think to yourself, well, if natural man hates to be convicted of his sin and is going to hate me if I bring it up, well, why would I do that? Why wouldn't I just tell people that God loves them and he wants them to spend eternity with him? Now, this is the approach that many take, but here's the problem. If we never talk about their personal sin, how can we talk about their personal repentance? If you don't think repentance is integral to salvation, take a look at what Jesus had to say on the subject. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, we see Jesus preached repentance. 
I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And then in Luke again, no, I tell you that unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. You know, it is not fashionable to talk about repentance today. And many don't because they think they can or should try to avoid the hatred of the world. They'd just rather be positive. But in trying to avoid our momentary discomfort, we can lead people into a false conversion that puts them in eternal discomfort. We must be faithful to the whole gospel and that includes telling people that they need to repent because their sin separates them from God. Now, believe it or not, we also have Christians on the other side of the coin. They seem to delight in telling everyone what a horrible sinner they are. Now, the problem isn't acknowledging we're horrible sinners because we are. The problem is in the seeming delight some take over it. Have you run into that type? I do not get that. The unsaved are in bondage to their sin, just as we once were. How can there be any delight in that? You know, it should cause us to weep. Let's take a look at the final two verses of our chapter, John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you, the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. The last two verses of our passage, John 15, you know, they encourage Christ's disciples that the Holy Spirit, who we've seen called here in our text uh, using the ESV, the helper, or some translations have it, a counselor or advocate, he will bear witness about Jesus in addition to the disciples bearing witness about him. How glad I am that the Holy Spirit helps us, not just those disciples of olden days, but he helps us with our witness too. I know that I have given some pretty ratty gospel presentations on the spur of the moment and still seen the Holy Spirit use my poor words to bring life to someone else. Thank God that we still have the helper. Join us next week on Scripturology as we study John chapter 16 and continue the farewell discourse and we learn even more about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer.